This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 29. Coming up on Space Time, new insights into the ancient asteroid Ryugu, the sun getting more violent, and NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 arrives aboard the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists studying samples from the asteroid Ryugu have identified some of the oldest material in the solar system. Back in June 2018, Japan's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft retrieved samples from the kilometre-wide asteroid and successfully returned them to Earth, parachuting them down into the warmer rocket range in outback South Australia. Now researchers analysing those samples have identified what they believe could be some of the oldest solids to have formed in the solar system. Tiny grains dating back some 4.6 billion years. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, focused on spherical mineral grains called chondrolite objects and calcium aluminium rich inclusions, or CAIs. These grains are key components of chondritic meteorites, which are delivered to Earth from the asteroid belt without being modified by processes such as melting that can affect other meteorites. The samples of Ryugu give scientists a unique opportunity to study material freshly gathered from an asteroid that, at the time of sampling, would have been around 15 million kilometres from Earth. But the surprising evidence coming from this latest research suggests that Ryugu was initially formed much further away, somewhere out in the darker reaches of the outer solar system. A key finding of the analysis is that the grains in the Ryugu samples were likely transported in ever-widening circles from the inner regions of the early solar system out to far more distant regions where the original Ryugu asteroid eventually formed. The team's conclusions are partially based on analysing the ratio of different oxygen isotopes in the samples. Now these are forms of oxygen with varying masses due to differing numbers of neutrons in their nucleus. The lower mass oxygen-16 isotope has one less neutron than oxygen-17 and two fewer than oxygen-18. Many of the Ryugu grains are enriched with oxygen-16. The isotope content, together with analysis of the grain sizes and mineral composition, led the researchers to suggest their ancient origin and likely transport outwards to the far reaches of the solar system that eventually became part of a body that then fragmented to form the asteroid Ryugu. The study's lead author, geochemist Daisuke Nakashima from Toyushu University, says the team now want to analyse more of these oldest solar system solids in Ryugu to try and understand the mechanisms behind the radio transport outwards in the early solar nebula. See, this is fundamental research into the ancient events which helped build our solar system. Meanwhile, another team of scientists working on their own sample of Ryugu have found a rich complement of organic molecules. The discovery, reported in the journal Science, adds support to the idea that organic material from space contributed to the inventory of chemical compounds that were necessary for the evolution of life. Organic molecules are the building blocks of all known forms of terrestrial life. They consist of a wide variety of compounds made up of carbon combined with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and a variety of other atoms. But they're not necessarily a signature of life. That's because they can also be made through chemical reactions that don't involve life. The science of prebiotic chemistry attempts to discover the compounds and reactions that could have given rise to life, and among the prebiotic organics found in these samples were several kinds of amino acids. Now, certain amino acids are widely used by terrestrial life as a component to build proteins. Proteins are essential for life as we know it, and they're used to make enzymes which speed up and regulate chemical reactions in the body and make structures ranging from the microscopic right through to the enormous. The sample taken from Ryugu also contained many types of organics that usually form in the presence of liquid water, including alphatic amines, carboxylic acids, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and nitrogen-containing heterocyclic compounds. The study's lead author, Hiroshi Naoka from Kyushu University, says the presence of prebiotic molecules on the asteroid surface, despite its harsh environment caused by solar heating, ultraviolet irradiation, and cosmic ray irradiation, all under high vacuum conditions, suggests that the uppermost surface grains of Ryugu have the potential to protect organic molecules. 
These molecules can then be transported through the solar system, potentially dispersing as interplanetary dust particles after being ejected from the uppermost layers of the asteroid by impacts and other causes. So far, the amino acid results from Ryugu are consistent with what's already been seen on other carbon-rich carbonaceous meteorites. However, sugars and nucleobases, which are the components of DNA and RNA, have been discovered in some carbon-rich meteorites, but not yet identified in the samples returned from Ryugu. Now, it's possible that these compounds are present, but are below current analytical detection limits, given the relatively small sample mass available for study. And the research doesn't end there. Other samples of Ryugu have been sent to other laboratories around the world, including NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where NASA scientist Heather Graham is examining Ryugu's treasures. In this report from NASA TV, Graham begins by telling the legend of Hayabusa and Ryugu according to Japanese mythology. Long ago, a fisherman named Urashima Taro rescued a small turtle from a group of mischievous children. A few days later, a giant turtle greeted Urashima Taro and carried him beneath the sea to Ryugu Castle. There, Princess Otohime thanked Taro for rescuing the little turtle and rewarded him with a mysterious box of treasure. Today is really exciting. We're picking up a bunch of samples from the asteroid Yugu, and this is an asteroid that was visited by a spacecraft from Japan. This was the Hayabusa 2 mission, and this is the second mission of its kind that they've sent out to asteroids. It's very similar to the OSIRIS-REx mission that NASA has to the asteroid Bennu. They went and visited this asteroid, and they landed actually two rovers on the surface to help them figure out where they wanted to sample, and then brought the samples back here to Earth December of 2020. Our partners at the Japanese Space Agency sent us a box full of samples from Yugu. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that everything is okay. It'd be really terrible to bring something that far away from space and then have something go terribly wrong in shipping from Japan to the U.S. So we just wanted to check everything out, make sure that the packaging was intact, that everything that was shipped was there and that nothing was leaking and that was all fine. And then we put it in the freezer for safekeeping. So sample return mission is a really important scientific activity. Often when we think about space exploration, we're thinking about rovers and flyby missions, and we forget the true value of just bringing things back into our analytical facilities here on Earth. And that's something the scientific community has been doing really well for a long time. If you think about the moon samples and solar particles, and now asteroids are just some of the many samples that we're bringing back to try and understand the solar system. That's organic geochemist Heather Graham from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And this is space time. Still to come, increasing intensity in solar flares and coronal mass ejections show that our sun's getting more violent. And NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 arrives safely aboard the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Planet Earth has just caught a glancing blow from a coronal mass ejection which blasted out of the sun following an M8.6 class solar flare last week. The event exploded out of sunspot pack AR3234 and was observed by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft as an extreme ultraviolet flash. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, issued a warning about the space weather event, saying minor G1-class geomagnetic storms were possible. Solar flares are powerful bursts of energy, erupting out of sunspot groups on the sun's surface. Sunspots are slightly darker regions of the sun's visible surface, where magnetic field lines from deep inside the sun loop out into space and then back down below the surface again. These can trigger solar flares, and the flares can trigger coronal mass ejections, which fling billions of tons of plasma and magnetic field material into space. Now, if these space weather events, known as geomagnetic storms, target the Earth, they can overwhelm the planet's protective magnetosphere, which shields the Earth from the solar wind, the constant flow of charged particles streaming out from the sun. They're capable of damaging and even destroying spacecraft by shorting out their delicate circuits. 
or limiting a spacecraft's life by causing the Earth's atmosphere to expand and contract, thereby increasing atmospheric drag on a spacecraft, resulting in orbital decay. They can also disrupt communications and navigation systems, black out terrestrial power grids on the planet's surface, and increase radiation doses not just for astronauts in orbit, but also for people in high-altitude aircraft. In fact, space weather events have caused several radio blackouts to be reported over the last couple of months. On the other hand, these events also trigger spectacular auroral light displays as charged particles travel along Earth's magnetic field lines towards the poles. The stunning light shows, known as the Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis, northern and southern lights, are caused by atoms and molecules getting excited by charged particles in the upper atmosphere, and that causes them to emit photons of different coloured light depending on which particles are being excited. In fact, the northern lights were so spectacular that a pilot on a Finnair flight last week actually performed a full 360-degree turn to allow everybody aboard the flight to see the fantastic northern light show. Our sun's been growing increasingly active in recent weeks as it continues to move into solar cycle 25. See, the sun goes through an 11-year solar cycle during which it gets progressively more and more violent until it eventually reaches solar maxima, at which time the magnetic poles suddenly flip polarity. The North Pole becomes South and South-North. That's expected to occur around mid-2025. The Sun will then gradually quieten down again to what's known as solar minima. That will happen around 2031, when the next solar cycle, number 26, will begin. The most powerful event in recent times happened on February the 17th, when NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft detected a strong X2.2 class solar flare. Now, X class donates the strongest and most intense flares, while the number provides more information about its strength. And just over a week later, a magnetic filament erupted on the surface of the Sun, setting off a chain reaction that included another solar flare two types of radio blackout, and a coronal mass ejection resulting in minor to moderate geomagnetic storm activity. The storm set Earth's magnetic field reverberating from the coronal mass ejection, and it triggered a G3-class magnetic storm. There were widespread aurorae across northern Europe and North America, with reports saying the aurora was seen as far south as Colorado. Another coronal mass ejection arrived the next day, re-energising and extending the storm. And the space weather activities continued into March, with no less than six active sunspot regions currently visible on the solar surface. The one we mentioned earlier, AR3234, remains the largest and most productive solar flare region, and is showing continued unstable growth. All the remaining sunspot regions are either stable or in decay. However, a return sunspot region, AR32123, which previously produced lots of M-class solar flares, is currently rotating onto the sun's eastern limb. But it's not yet fully visible enough to determine its magnetic complexity. At this stage, scientists are saying the solar activity is expected to include the possibility of more isolated low-level solar flares. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 arrives safely aboard the International Space Station, and later in the science report, a new study shows companies claiming to fight climate change often have the worst climate records. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 has arrived safely aboard the International Space Station. The mission aboard the Dragon spacecraft Endeavour was flown from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The launch had been delayed twice by technical issues, once after bleeding was detected in some areas on the liner and the second time following an engine ignition fault. The flight was the ninth manned mission for SpaceX and NASA's sixth SpaceX commercial crew rotation mission. The Falcon 9 core stage returned safely to Earth, landing on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. The spacecraft successfully docked with the orbiting outpost's Harmony module just 12 hours after launch. 
Once on station, Crew 6 joined the Expedition 6869 crew, bringing the orbiting outpost complement temporarily to 11 crew members, at least until SpaceX Crew 5 leave later this week aboard their own Dragon capsule. During their six-month stay on station, Crew 6 will help prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit, undertaking experiments on how particular materials burn in microgravity, tissue chip research on heart, brain and cartilage functions, and an investigation that will collect microbial samples from outside the space station. Less than a day after the space station flight, SpaceX launched another Falcon 9 on the adjacent pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, carrying 21 upgraded version 2 mini Starlink internet satellites into orbit. That launch had been delayed several hours to allow radiation levels in space to drop following the solar storm activity we mentioned earlier. Following main engine cutoff and stage separation, the Falcon's first stage returned to Earth, landing on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study claims using aspirin on a regular basis helps lower a female's risk of ovarian cancer regardless of whether or not they're genetically susceptible. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on research undertaken in eight separate studies. Researchers found that having known genetic variants linked to ovarian cancer doesn't appear to impact the protection females get from taking aspirin daily or almost daily use for six months or longer. Across the board, females who took aspirin frequently ended up having a 30% lower risk of ovarian cancer. A new study warns that Australia's rarest bird of prey, the red goshawk, is facing extinction. Queensland's Cape York Peninsula is now the only place known to support breeding populations. The findings reported in the journal Emu Austral Ornithology show that over four decades, the bird has lost at least a third of its historical range. This unique bird of prey has long captivated bird watchers with its striking reddish-brown plumage, deeply fingered wingtips, heavy yellow legs and oversized talons. Scientists say that while the threats driving the red goshawk's decline require further investigation, habitat loss and degradation, mining and agriculture have all played a key role. In a classic case of watch what I do, not what I say, new researchers found that companies claiming to have initiatives to tackle climate change, such as sustainability committees or environmental and social governance commitments, are likely to be responsible for high greenhouse gas emissions. The findings, reported in the British Journal of Management, analysed emissions and company policy across nearly 600 companies in 35 countries over the past 20 years. They found a direct link between a company's climate change virtue signalling and high greenhouse gas emissions. They say this supports the theory of companies greenwashing with symbolic gestures rather than making material changes that can help fight climate change. The 2023 Mobile World Congress is wrapped up in Barcelona with all the latest cell phone gadgetry on display. The smartphones on display included Nokia's new G22 repairable budget phone, new products from Motorola and Samsung, as well as Xiaomi's Discovery Edition augmented reality wireless glasses, which use electrochromatic glass and Qualcomm's Snapdragon XR2 Generation 1 processor. With all the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex saharov Royt from ITY.com. The coolest phones were, there's this one from OnePlus, which has sort of this ring around four uh, cameras on the back. You know, the iPhone has three. I mean, you can often uh, tell the phones by the camera array on mm, the back. Yeah. And that's a very cool looking one. Then there's a, a Motorola phone where the, the bottom of the phone, it actually slides out. So it goes from like a four inch phone to like a 6.7 inch phone. So it allows you to have the utility of a smaller device, but then it just rolls open to, to be bigger. There's also the one inch sensors inside of the Xiaomi phone. So these are you know, very big uh, cameras 
compared to the most of the camera sensors that we see in smartphones, and so it's supposed to pick up more detail, more light. We also saw an announcement from Telstra where they have now been able to have a 5G data call on a 100-kilometer long-range system using the mid-band TDD advanced antenna system, uh, they say, in a live commercial network. So this was a software update that extends the maximum cell range from 15 kilometers up to 100 it's using 5G massive MIMO AAS advanced antenna system radios to do this. And Microsoft have their new Bing Search toolbar on the way, but it's still not there for everyone yet. Tell me about it. They're going to be introducing the Bing Search AI into the toolbar, so you don't even have to worry about changing browsers. If you want to talk to your chat GPT-powered Bing agent, it's just there in the taskbar. So Microsoft of just sort of embracing and extending these technologies and, and getting them to you know just be in people's faces in the hope that they will use it. Now, you do still have to join the wait list, but the wait list has been getting more and more people all the time. It's only three weeks that we've had this, and uh, Bing has uh, famously melted down the uh, professed love for people who wanted to get people with, with revenge, uh, do all sorts of weird things, exhibiting this unhinged behavior Is as we spoke about before. marry people and, and get people to leave <laughs> well, their wives? Because Bing has been limited to six questions on any given topic, they're trying to really impede Bing's ability to get confused purposefully confused and antagonized by people who are seeking for this language model to spit out things that could indicate that it's sentient or mad, but actually it's probably really the language model doing the work and being very convincing and doing so. I mean, true AI that is human level, according to a chart that I saw from MWC 2023, it's still a couple of decades away. I mean, this is uh, what we sort call of di- singularity you're talking about. Well, it, it would have to be, yeah, it would have to be that sort of concept. And now what we're saying, and because it's because it's, the concern is real, we're saying don't trust AI, don't trust ChatGPT. I mean, double check it, make sure that the, the claims it's making are correct. Both Microsoft and Google. Google Bard made mistakes about the James Space Webb Telescope. Now, they fact-checked Bing search at Bing launch and it made mistakes too. Yeah, and they, uh, they didn't to, lose. Uh, they got it to write a detailed biography about a, a, a famous, was it uh, Italian physicist? Uh, only thing is he never existed. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it writes things with great confidence. I saw a tweet the other day showing how there were sources for this information that looked very plausible, but when those people were looked up, they didn't exist. And yet, you know, it was quoting pages and books and passages. And so, you know, just like we oh, couldn't we trust Wikipedia before. The university I went to then. <laughs> well, just like we couldn't trust Wikipedia, and some people would presumably claim you still can't trust, you must fact-check everything. Well, it's exactly the same for AI, and even more so, given the, the convincingness. Now, i tell you what I saw the other day that was freaky. Now, this is from China. It's a, uh, how would you describe it? I guess it's remote kissing, where you plug these, they look like something the Cardassians would have a <laughs> a big set of lips that plug into right. your phone. These are synthetic lips. And you have another set of these, which the person who you like to kiss has. And then you get to kiss each other remotely via the phone. Now, it reminds me very much of a scene at a Big Bang Theory, but uh, we won't go there. <laughs> well, I mean, this telepresence, this uh, the ability to uh, get haptic feedback and be as immersed as you can in that environment, even though it's all virtual, is uh, only going to get more and more realistic. I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be another person on the other side. It could be your chat GPT version, you know, seven or something. It's much more advanced and it's your virtual partner. And uh, how many people are going to want to choose that? Finding that a uh, an AI partner is so much cleaner and uh, the relationship you have with an AI is much simpler and easier, not as emotionally messy as the one you'd have with a physical person. Did you just say seven as in seven of nine, a tricky thing? Well, I was just trying to think of a number that was... Uh, We're learning future. a lot about you. <laughs> That's Alex Saharov royd from ITY.com. Um... And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 